Good morning, everybody. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, the holiday. For many, it's the time to start enjoying summer. It bookends the start of summer like Labor Day does for the end of summer. For me, it's a good day. Year, well, I won't say how many years, but May 31st in the past, my wife was born. This time last year, my daughter was reborn into Christ, the baptism. So it's a good day. However, Memorial Day hasn't always been about barbecues and beaches. It started out as a time of remembrance, time to honor those who had fallen in war. And if anybody's been watching the news, this last week, we didn't have a war here, but we certainly had some, some craziness. There were a lot of fallen souls at the VTA. I personally don't know the victims, but in my work, I've often been at the sheriff's office, right next door to the county offices, and so it's only like a block away from there. This is an area where I worked, made presentations, attended meetings, walked to lunch, spent a lot of time in that area. It's not a place where such a tragedy should have occurred, but it did. One person was in pain, a lot of pain. So much so that they left their house and set it on fire knowing that they're never coming back. They walked to the meeting their coworkers and they opened fire. That person's pain killed 10 people, including themselves. Now, at work, me and my coworkers have had crazy days. Doesn't seem like anything we're gonna do is ever gonna matter. And it seems like the train wreck that we work at is so crazy, you just gotta laugh it off. We even hit times of dark humor. The trench guns, we long trench coats and long guns, but we're never serious. I'm not even sure any of us even actually own a trench coat. Now, for this person to have done this, to take the action they did, only God knows the mind of the person who decided to take those actions, take the lives of the co-workers, and only God knows the exact reasons why they did it. However, there are things we do know. We know that they were alone. We know they had enough pain in their lives, pain in their lives, they decided to take it out on others including themselves. In times like this, it's easy to caricature the shooter. Think of him as pure evil, soulless enemy, a nameless horror. But deep down, you know that's not the case. They were human. They have a soul. They hurt. They were alone, and they were ready to end it all. Anybody watches the news, it happens a lot. Way more than it should. There have been weekends when you come to the paper. I've even got my phone right now, and I've got two things on it. Santa Clara City Hall assault case. Police dead, two dead, over 20 injured in a, in a concert in Florida. These are all actual headlines that you see. Seven mass shootings in the weekend, 147 this year. A father and a son got in a gunfight and it got captured on a security camera. What is going on with this world in this country? I don't know. The only person I know that does is God. And he's the only one that can help with what's going on. And with that, let's pray. We need it right now. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, please be with this country. Please be with this world. All the pain, all the suffering that people are going through, Father, only you can help make things better. Father, please heal the victims of the tragedies that have been happening. Please heal the people that are hurting that even would even consider something like this, Father. Father, please help those that would even consider this to find another way to relief. Help them to find you. Help them to find a better way to go about things. Father, please let clear heads prevail. Please let your love prevail. Please slow the tempers. Father, please help people to remain calm. Father, please help us to go out in this world 
and show others your love so this doesn't happen, Lord. Thank you for all things, Father. Please watch over us all. And we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God is the only one who can really do this, can really change it. But we're here. So what do we do? What is our, what, what can we do possibly? Now, as much as it'd be cool, be like the minority report and go, this guy, that guy, that guy, stop him. And be done with it. We don't have the tactile gloves or the, the pool full of psychics to help us, do we? We can't do that. But what do we know? Who would have thought that there would be a shooting at a garlic festival two years ago? VTA train yard this last week. Those places don't make sense. It boggles the mind that something like that would happen in places like that. Honestly, pretty much anywhere, for that matter. What do we know? We know that there are a lot of lonely people out there, a lot of hurting people out there. There is a lot of work to be done, and people need help. So what can we do? Well, we're here to worship God. So let's look to him for a moment. How can we help those that are hurting? Let's turn to James. 127. James 127 reads, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And you know, after tragedies like have been happening, there's a lot of orphans and widows to be helped. They could use some help, use some encouraging words, help paying their bills, use a community that cares about them. Well, let's turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 35 through 40, or 34 through 40. Then the king to say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. Then the righteous answered him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now imagine if someone reached out to those lost souls and showed them God's love well before they thought of ever taking other people's lives. That they got to the point that it did this last Wednesday. Reaching out to those in need helps keep the person from getting to that point of too much desperation. Helps them get some help before it is too late. Small, early interventions are so much better and easier than trying large, later in large scale interventions. So, as I was saying, small early interventions are way better than late ones. You can reach somebody early, that's a lot better than trying to reach them late. This last Wednesday morning, probably nothing would have stopped that guy. Somebody reached him a few years back, might have changed his course of his life. We don't know. But let's look at Matthew 22. This is the scripture reading this morning. Thank you, brother, for reading that. Matthew 22, we'll just read the last part, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Loving our neighbors is the second greatest commandment. 
after this pandemic, and there's so much loss, so much fear, so much grief, after so many have been struggling for food, for clothing, for shelter, from relief to all the debt that's been piled up and people have been out of work. I went through a period when even the leaders encouraged violence against each other and stoked division with every other word. After all that we've gone through, there are a lot of hurting souls out there. Lots of families in need. Lots of souls who need God more than they ever have. The physical pandemic is finally getting better. We're able to meet in the building. We're able to get vaccines. We got a vaccine against the virus that's been ravaging this world this past year. However, we have a vaccine against what is ailing this world. The pain, the hurt, the sorrow. People this world are facing. We have God. We have his word. We have his love. We have him. Loving our neighbors as ourselves isn't only good for society. It leads others to God by showing others his love. Not only do we have God, we also have his commandment. Notice the teacher didn't say, what's the greatest suggestion? He's asking, what's the greatest commandment? We're commanded to love our neighbor. And it's right below loving God. And we know that God is all-powerful. But how is it that we have what we have and what we are a vaccine against what ails this world and what's happening all around us? How does that work? What if that shooter had a loving family, a stable home life, friends who could laugh the crazy he would, a community that loved him, supported him? Would he have ended up carrying out the rampage that he did? What do we have to help with? First off, look around the room. Whether you're on Zoom or here in the building, we are a family. And that's powerful. We have each other. We care and support each other. When we hear the Eileen sisters in the hospice care, the Julie's grandmother stopped eating, we start praying. We start making phone calls. We start sending cards. We reach out. We rally around. We're together to support those in need. Imagine if other people felt that. If other people had the same type of support that we have. When we hear some of our young men graduate, going through those momentous occasions of their lives, Good times, too. Darius Carbon, graduate from the University of Georgia. Again, Joshua Sawyer, graduating from high school. We're here to support them, sharing those joys, the good times and the bad. That means a lot. We rally around those people in those accomplishments and encourage them. They start new phases of their lives, and that's awesome. But imagine if more people had this family like we do. Share the joys, the big moments in their lives. How much better a world we live in, if that was the case. There's so much that a life for God has to offer to the person from the right path and away from darkness in their lives. Let's focus on just one for today. We've got something so big and some, so complex. Where do we start? How do we do it? As with anything complex, we deal with it by breaking down. Focus on a part at a time. Let's start at the very beginning. See what God has to do to help us make it through this crazy world. Try to understand one part of that vaccine for the issues of society's issues. That will help keep the things like happened this last week from happening in the future. And honest truth, keep things from happening in the first place is what God actually intended. He doesn't intend for us to live like this. Let's turn to Genesis. I'm going to start there. The beginning of God's word. Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable to him. Now our God is incredibly smart. He knows if us guys are left alone, we get in trouble, right? <laughs> he knows to give us someone. We make it through this world without breaking ourselves and everything else. So he knew what he was doing. And let's skip down a little bit further. Genesis 2, 23 and 25. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and a mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and they're both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. Right away, straight out of the gate, God instituted marriage. He started families. He knew, and that's the first institution we need, is our families. Let's take our cues from him, and let's start there. Start with a family. And why don't we start with family? Or something like what happened last week. We as humans start our lives as family. It's the first and best place to import morals. We all are here is a reaction to or against the way we were brought up, the way we were raised. Starting early with a new generation in the right direction, help keep issues from rising in the first place. For my part, if it wasn't for my parents, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be here. From a very young age, they taught me about God, His Word. They demonstrated God's Word in their life. One year we were on vacation, one summer. We didn't have a lot of money, so that vacation was basically pile in the car in the morning, drive as far as you can into the mountains, and then when everybody's tired out, you know my dad was tired, he'd drive us back home. That was our vacation. But on that vacation, my dad did something he probably didn't even remember. They were, we were driving to the Smoky Mountains in the park. If anybody's ever seen it, they have these boxes where you can get a pamphlet that tells about the park. And they asked for a donation. There were no cameras. There are no videos. There is nobody around, not even a park attendant. There's nobody. We could have grabbed as many as we wanted to and walked away. My dad went and found money and made sure to put it in that box. He did the right thing. He probably doesn't remember this. But I still think about that. When no one was around, he did what was right. Little things like that. Seeing my dad and my mom live out God's word made a huge difference. We don't have to be philosophers. We don't have to have a master's in divinity to teach our kids. We simply have to tell them the truth. Show them the truth and action in our lives. Teaching our, God, teaching our kids God's word is really easy. Living at all times is a bit harder. But it's something we need to do. Even when no one else is watching, our kids are. They're seeing what we do. And we owe it to them to show them God's love at all times through our lives. And God sowed this. Deuteronomy 4, 8 through 10. This is what he's telling the children of Israel. Teach their kids. Deuteronomy 4, 8 through 10. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as there all are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord, your God, and world. When the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words. They that hear may learn to fear me all the days that they live on this earth. They may teach their children. God knew that they had those parents, had to know what they're doing and teach their kids. The more families that practice this, the more we have in this church, the in God's family, the stronger the society will be, the better this place will be. For real, long-lasting change to occur, and it has to carry on to the next generation. So many times you're reading about the Bible, the cycle of sin. They do great, they don't teach them, the next generation comes, they forget about it. We've got to change that. We can't, for this world to change, for those things like last Wednesday not to happen anymore or happen much less, it's got to be a generational change. Building our families, encouraging them, ensuring they're strong and able to grow the next generation to what knows God and loves Him is incredibly important. As a church family, that's an important part of our job. We are that village that grows those kids. We are the ones who help shape them. The more strong families are in this world, the more persons are supported during good and dark times in their lives, less likely we're going to have things like we did last week. Well, folks who didn't have the best upbringing had a rough home life. Well, as I said before, we're all in reaction to or against what we grew up with. 
the situation make the church family that much more important? If you think about it, Abraham, he left his family to follow God. Ruth left her land, her family, to follow God. Matthew, he was a tax collector. He was not so savior of a character taking people's money. And yet he ended up writing one of the Gospels. As a church family, we're made up of folks from all sorts of backgrounds. And this is another important part of our function, of our church family. For example, just like the nuclear family brings up children, babes in Christ, new converts, need to be brought up in the love of God also. It's just as important to teach and show God's love to persons newly coming to God as it is for our children. For the new persons, all the rest of us also, we need that encouragement, right? The journey to love God is a never-ending one. But you've got to go stronger every day, every moment, with something new. And you can never stop that. Even it's more important for us to rally around folks that are new and bring them to God's love. Even persons who find God on the right track and well-supported keeps that many more persons on the right track instead of heading down dark and destructive paths. Even ourselves on the right track, supporting others so we remain strong, and able to help others makes a difference. Families, particularly God's family, this family we have here, can and should have a powerful effect on society. That's the reason we're here. He told us we're the light of the world for a reason. We owe it to ourselves, our kids, to commit our lives to God. We signed up for the work that the Lord wants us to do. We made that commitment starting with helping families in the church, and the family that is this church, is a great place to start. Changing the way this world works, and commit events like what happened last Wednesday from happening again. It will build a new generation, strong in God's love. It will build a community that supports each other, helps those who are in need, that are hurting. We can reach out before it gets too late. Have those conversations while they're still talk and not with bullets. Am I saying that if we start with families, all will be rainbows, unicorns, puppy dogs? No. We still live in a broken world. All will not be completely well until we reach heaven with God. What I am saying is I'm concerned about what is happening in this world. I'm raising three young people. And I'm worried about what's going to happen in this place. What world are they growing up in, into? There are too few people who know God's love, who know His, what it is to live with God, that are on this crazy marble we call home. For us to sit here and sit still and think that all is well. We are humans. And we serve an incredible, powerful God. We ourselves cannot do much to change society. However, our God is very wise. He provides us an incredible instruction manual, and He shows us the things that we can do. We can reach out to those who are hurting and in need. And at times like this, you can pick a direction and walk, and you will find them. They're everywhere. And there's so many people who'd be better off knowing God and knowing His love. We can build up God's family right here in this family, in this congregation. Our prayer list is long. It grows. If you look at the back of the bulletin, it stays pretty long. There are persons right here who need support, who need encouragement. There are those going through big moments in their lives who need to share with others. We can share in, lift those up. Give them good starts and new paths and adventures in their lives. There are plenty of work to do. We need to get started. Little actions, small steps, those things make a difference. Sometimes it's much bigger than we'll ever know. We may not know what's going to happen, what effect it will have on those people that we, we shared a kind word with. How do you change the world? One step, one action, one person at a time. Let's end with a challenge for this next week. 
this next week, two challenges. First one, find someone to encourage. As you go throughout your life, as you run into people, find somebody at your work or at the grocery store, encourage them, lift them up. And if you need a place to start, we've got a bulletin with a whole list of people. Work for you. Our prayer list is full of people who need re reached out to. Remember what it means to be a child of God and help those who you see in pain. A challenge for the summer, the second and last one. In a few weeks, we'll have Mike Alock joining us. He's making a big transition. He's coming from all the way from the Philippines to San Jose without his family at first. And that's big. We are a family. Let's rally around him. Help him in that transition. Show him how great it is to come here and be part of this family. How good it is to be part of God's house. Let's show that we're ready to work with him. He's fired up and he's enthused. Let's work right along beside him. There's so many souls that need to be touched. And let's let God lead the way into their hearts. When we have him here, when we rally around him, when we work together as a community, we can make a big difference. That's the message for this morning. Simple, small steps. We can't have what keeps happening around this place. We've got to do something. If you want to join God's family this morning, be baptized. If there's anything that you need, anything that this congregation do for you, any prayers that you need, please come as we stand and we sing.